Hey there students! Welcome to the third part of my three-part lecture series on reform in Britain in the early 19th century. If you've been following along, then you've seen that we have discussed the Reform Act of 1832 and the Chartist Movement. And in this third part, we are going to focus on the Corn Laws, their passage and repeal. This segment goes out to Emily at Henry Clay High School in Lexington, Kentucky, and the rest of her AP Euro class with Everyday Apples and all of those other great people who are there at Henry Clay High School. So, let's go on with the Corn Laws. Now, first of all, most important thing to know about the Corn Laws, as I said earlier, is that they weren't even about corn, all right? In America, when we hear corn, we think... Well, this, we think corn, all right? But the Corn Laws, as far as the parlance of 19th century Britain, this was about wheat, which they called corn and may still call it that. So the Corn Laws were a protective tariff on foreign wheat. Now, why would we not want to import foreign wheat? Well, what you do here is you put up this tariff and it artificially raises the price of foreign wheat so that, well, now the price of domestic wheat can be higher and this is a conservative effort by the landowners who were dominating parliament in 1815 to make sure that their wheat sold for top prices and so the prices went up and what this did is it enriched the landed gentry at the expense of everyone else in the country, which was just fine with them because that was the whole point. They're in Parliament, Parliament's there to serve them, and, you know, they reap the benefits. The rich get richer. And so the movement, though, at this time, keep in mind that liberalism is gaining steam. And the classical liberals, they believe the same way as Adam Smith, that what you need is not protection, you need free trade. Because free trade is not concerned with the producer, free trade is concerned with the consumer. Which, of course, today we hear debates back and forth about, okay, all of our jobs are going overseas. Well, why is that happening? Well, what happens is that prices go down. These goods that are made in other countries, less developed countries, they cost less. And so free trade makes sure that the consumer will pay the lowest price for, well, consumer goods. And so in the early 19th century, you see the formation of the Anti-Corn Law League. And the Anti-Corn Law League was a curious alliance between liberals and radicals, between the bourgeois industrial class and the working class. Now they had two different reasons for wanting these changes. First of all, the radical opposition, they want lower grain prices because they want cheaper food. Makes sense. Now the liberal opposition, they also want lower grain prices, but these are the people who own the factories and run businesses and stuff like that. And if the price of grain is cheaper, the price of food is cheaper, well, they don't have to pay their workers as much. So both of these groups have a reason for allying together and opposing the corn laws, but they're doing this for two different reasons. Now, the nail in the coffin for the Corn Laws would be the Irish potato famine, which started in 1845. And the whole idea here, I mean, you see what's going on in Ireland at this time, that in some places as many as 30% of the population is gone, some to death and some to immigration to Britain and to the United States. But the question is, how can Parliament keep the price of corn artificially high when people are starving? Now, granted, getting rid of the Corn Laws wasn't going to do a whole lot to get rid of the Irish potato famine, but that's not what politicians think about. Politicians think about things that are going to help them pass what they want to pass. And Sir Robert Peel, who ironically was a leader of a Tory conservative government, he decided that he wanted to repeal the Corn Law. So with the Irish potato famine going on, he's using this uh, as kind of a uh, you know pathetic uh, appeal in order to get people to support this. Now, 
the bill to repeal the Corn Laws was passed over the opposition of his own party. The conservatives didn't back it, but he relied on uh, the other parties, the liberals and the radicals, in order to pass this. And one thing about Peel, now get it, his administration repealed. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I know it really wasn't that funny, but still. So he knew that this was going to bring down his ministry, that he would no longer be the prime minister after this passed. And sure enough, a few days later, he had to resign as prime minister. So it was a very courageous act on his part to do what he thought was the right thing, to repeal a law that was not in the best interest of the nation as a whole. And so once again, what we see building up here is that reform from above will reduce radical agitation. The Corn Laws were repealed just a few years before the revolutions of 1848 are hitting the continent. And so with statesmen like Peel, Britain is avoiding the sort of thing that happened all over the rest of Europe in 1848. So reform is better than revolution. Parliament was willing to pass modest reforms, not radical reform, but they were willing to do something. If you think about what was going on before the French Revolution, you know, at the time of the Estates General, what is the Third Estate? Everything. What has it been until now? Nothing. What does it wish to become? Something. And so when you see what uh, Peel and politicians like him were willing to do, it's like, look, that we're at least saying that we are going to acknowledge the existence of working people in our country. And so ultimately, workers really just want more money. And food. Food is great too. Not a revolution, all right? When you look at the revolutions of 1848, these are people who are desperate, people who have been told over and over again that their concerns are not even going to be minimally addressed. And, of course, Karl Marx is not happy about this because Karl Marx thought that, well, you know, England will be the place where this whole proletarian violent revolution happens. And it wasn't. Sorry, Karl. And so that's that. Hopefully you enjoyed this lecture series and there will be plenty more. Make sure that if you haven't subscribed already that you do that. TomRitchie.net, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that kind of stuff. So that's that. Be back with more lectures soon. Until next time.